Hello and welcome to Mulch, with me your host Rebecca Anning Brown. This is a weekly podcast for flower farmers who want to build a confident flower farming practice that reflects the lifestyle that you want now and in the future. Each week I'll share conversation and tips to nurture and grow you and your flower farm. I'll open conversations that flower farmers find difficult to talk about, provide approaches that will help you to make decisions, chuckle at the idiosyncrasies of our work, and always be real and honest about my own work as a flower farmer. My goal is to help you to grow a curious, confident and grounded flower farming practice that flourishes as a business that you love and are proud to shout about. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and if you like what you hear please do leave a review and share the podcast with your flower farming friends. It really does help to grow a confident and successful flower farming community. Hello everyone and welcome back to Mulch. We've reached episode six. Hurrah, hurrah. Um, And today we are going to be talking about choosing plants as a flower farmer and not as a gardener. So a bit of a spoiler for you. The criteria for me are more than a flower or foliage being beautiful and holding well in a vase. Those are obviously really important criteria, but there are more. It's growing week five and I can really, really feel the excitement um, about the season ahead and the geek in me, and I am a bit of a geek, is really, really loving seeing on Instagram and YouTube the pictures and images of well-prepared, neat and tidy beds. And I know that it's just more mud and wood chip or PPX or grass if that is what you have around your beds and cardboard but especially after all the wind and all of the rain and the challenges over winter, it's really good to see the more positive preparatory steps in our work as flower farmers in the winter. And also, for me, this is a big one, the days are definitely longer and lighter and it's completely lifting my soul. It makes me so much happier. I can't wait for the season to begin. Okay, so before we crack on with today's episode, I thought I'd set up a little bit of fun for February. Fun for February for flower farmers. That was an unintended discussion of all the Fs. Anyway, in the notes, in the notes below and on the website, you will find a link to a free download for something called Flower Farmer Bingo. Now, this is just a bit of fun to get us through the next month. It's the shortest month of the year, but it's also a really important um, month in the year as flower farmers as we get ready for March, April, May, June, July, August and the rest of the year. So this bit of fun is inspired by Liz Mosley, who is a graphic designer who does all of our branding. She also has a podcast. It's fabulous. No, I'm not being paid. No, I'm not an affiliate. It's called Building Your Brand, and I will put a link to it in the show notes on our website. If you haven't found it, please do go and check it out. Follow it, because the catalogue, and especially the back catalogue of people in small businesses that she has interviewed is fabulous the pearls of wisdom and wonder are just marvelous and i really really recommend it and hope that it helps you in your businesses as much as it has helped me anyway liz loves a challenge and she loves to turn things into games now you might suggest that working with me is a challenge but that's a whole different conversation so this is more about following the sorts of challenges and games um, that she does to make her work more fun and to just give her that somewhere to go or a bit of guidance or a bit of a shape or framework so i thought i would give it a go too And rather than just doing it all alone on my lonesome here in Leeds, I thought that maybe we could have a go together. So I've actually never played bingo. I would love to go uh, just just once to Bingo Hall and just have a look and listen to all the lights and the pizzazz and the calling and 
the numbers and the number names and all of that sort of stuff. Now, like, truth be told, I'm a massive introvert. So the concept of being in a loud, bright, noisy place with music and numbers being shouted left, right and centre and people shouting bingo is actually my it's just my worst idea of an outing. But I do think that it would be really fun. So anyway, in this game of bingo, there are no fancy lights and no snazzy stampers in the shapes of of stars, whatever it is they have. Um, but what you can do instead is download an A4 sheet of paper and print it off, pop it by your desk, in your workshop, in your greenhouse, wherever you want. And on the download, you will see that there are 30 things to do. So the aim of the game is that you try and tick off as many of those things in the course of February. Now, you may do some of those things more than once. You may decide to print it off every week or every day and see how many of those things that you'll get done. And when you fill out a line, and I don't mind if it's horizontal, diagonal or vertical, when you complete a line, you can shout out bingo and if you're feeling really fun, share it with me in our DMs or even better, pop it in your stories just to completely entertain and bemuse your followers and your customers. Just have a bit of fun. And the other thing, if you do take absolutely everything off, you get to shout full house. I want to hear you shouting it full house, loud and proud. Um, and maybe one day if we all get together, we will have a game of bingo, proper bingo, just really for my entertainment more than anything else can you imagine having one of those kind of wheelie things that spin and spin and spin and getting up to put your hand in and pick the balls and choosing how to work that way every day i mean what fun would it be i'm not sure it would be logical unless of course you got to write the balls yourself at the beginning of the month Oh, interesting. You could use those balls in the same way as we use our flower farmer breakdown in the flower farmer's planner um, so you'd still get all the work that you needed doing. Anyway, you can hear me mulling over the idea. And if and when Anthony gets as far as editing this, you can hear him groaning. So I'm going to move on steadily. And it will be really interesting to see how much of this makes it into the actual podcast. Anyway, it's just a bit of fun. Please do download it. Um, bit of a disclaimer, when you download it, it does require you to sign up to our email newsletter. Any of you who are on our email newsletter already will know that I haven't sent out an email letter since before Christmas. I don't send lots of spam. The place to listen to me is here. The place to keep up with what's going on at Silver Grey Foliage is on Instagram and YouTube. Literally, it's used for communication when required if required so please do join the list if you want to or unsubscribe once you've downloaded flower farmer bingo okay so some of you will have noticed that i talk about the practice of flower farming quite a lot i don't just refer to what we do as flower farming or cut flower growing i refer to it as a practice and the reason that i do this is because i don't consider flower farming to be any different to any of my other professions and i have a few of them but it is correct, it's absolutely correct, that I don't have letters after my name because of my flower farming practice, and I don't have any specific pieces of paper in relation to my work and profession and business. However, it's also correct that to be a successful flower farming business, it requires study, research, risk assessment, hard work, the ability to learn from your mistakes, an absolute requirement to follow the evidence of good practice that others present and that you establish. And for me, the reason that that's relevant today is that, if I may, I'm going to make a statement that is possibly controversial. And that is that in my view, and it is obviously just my view, flower farming is distinct from and separate to the profession of gardening. I do think that both are professions, but they are not the same thing, even though some of the materials that we work with are identical. And so I'm going to start setting out my stool today for the practice of flower farming and why it's more than or different to gardening. So in today's discussion, in today's podcast, we are talking about the flowers and foliage that we choose to grow as flower farmers and specifically the criteria that 
I use when I'm choosing new things to grow in our in our field and in our gardens, in our field and our gardens. I feel like I really have to enunciate my consonants on the podcast today because we've spent some time with our children just reminding them to speak properly recently. I really do have to practice what I preach. Okay, so I do know that lots of gardeners become flower farmers and lots of flower farmers are keen gardeners. However, the reason that I think the two are distinct is because there are flowers that I would, and foliage, there are flowers and foliage that I would choose to grow in my field or in our garden for cutting that I know that gardeners wouldn't necessarily want in their gardens. And I say wouldn't necessarily because some gardeners may choose to have them and I'll come to that in a second. But the reason that I I first made this particular distinction between the two was that I did an article, I did an article for the RHS magazine just before Christmas about perennials for cutting. And (laughs) I think it's interesting because there are a number of flowers that I suggested for that that I very much so love to have in my garden and we definitely grow in our field for the purpose of cutting and for our flower farm. And yet they were tactfully excluded because some gardeners may consider them to be more like a weed. Now, just for clarification, if you're a florist or if you're one of my floral customers, I don't deliberately grow dandelions or any other weeds, though there is really a good argument from a soil regeneration perspective to do so. But that's, again, a whole different episode. Um, But I don't grow them because I consider them to be weeds. I grow them because they're beautiful and they add particular qualities to the bouquets and installations um, that florists create. I do think it's also worth adding that your perspective on this will, as a gardener, will change depending on the type of garden that you design or that your customers are asking for. Because one of the the examples that I'm going to give, I... Really, I really love it and we have loads of it in our garden that is not for the purpose of cutting and the reason that we have it in our garden is because I really like the swathes of flowers or foliage that you get when you design a prairie style garden. For me the combination of cottagey style, garden style and and prairie garden style go really, really well together when you get those mounds and swathes and carpets of particular colours that are then merged and blended together at different heights. I love it. But that is a particular style of gardening that I like and that may not be suited to other people's tastes, which is why gardening in and of itself is a gardening and garden design are a different art form and they're a different techniques, skill set and profession. So let's crack on. The aim of the game today is to talk about the criteria that we use when we are choosing cut flowers for our field, for our florists, for our bouquets, for our brides. These are the criteria that I look for other than beautiful and other than holds well in a vase because Oh, and good stem length. Those are three really good categories, but they're almost a given or an accepted in the work that we do, rather than specific and unique to our our choices. Okay, so first of all, I have self-seeding. So I don't have to work too hard. Flowers and foliage that self-seed easily mean that I don't have to work so hard to propagate them and have more plants to be able to offer and cut from. My second criteria is drought tolerance. Now, it's incredibly important given the way the climate is moving, uh, given that we have exceptionally hot periods over the past three, four years in spring and early in spring when we're trying to establish annuals I don't want to be spending time also watering and looking after my perennial plants. So a good level of drought tolerance or water resilience is important to me. 
pest resistance is also important to me. And for me, by that, I mean deer and rabbits rather than bugs, because I don't want my beautiful flowers to be eaten. Controversially, I like to grow invasive and competitive plants. Now, when I say invasive, I don't mean uh, plants that are not native to the UK. I mean that when they're put in a space, they fill it, and they fill it quicker than other things would do. And the reason that that's important to me is that it increases my abundance of flowers, and it also makes it quicker and more possible for me to increase my stock by division or propagation because big plants eventually die off in the middle and they're much more productive and they're very thankful to you if you split them up. So invasive or competitive um, plants are ones I really like to grow and look for. Other criteria are things like being multi-season. So by this, I mean that there is a long season of cutting. So from late spring into early summer or even early late summer, if possible, or that there are different seasons of interest for each and for the plant. So if you take Nepeta, for example, you can use it for its foliage late in spring, but you can use it for its flowers in early to mid-summer. And then moving on into autumn, winter, if you let those flower heads turn to that beautiful grey, wispy, light texture, you have a a different texture to add um, to your arrangements and instalments, instalments, installations. And you can also dry it quite nicely so it looks beautiful in a wreath. That is a plant that I love because it's great value for money. I can cut it all year round for different purposes, for different florists. Absolutely top of my list. The next thing that I look for is unique or uniqueness or something that's unusual. So when I'm talking about unique or un- or useful, I think about colour. So rather than thinking about blush, which will indeed be a subject for one podcast one day, it's half written and it's so hard to do justice to that it will be half written for a while. Um, But anyway, I mean the shades and the hints and the tones and the colours that blend together to make an interesting palette rather than something that's really flat and monotone. I also look for forms, so interesting shapes and sizes, interesting textures. Um, And I do look at those characteristics of whether flowers are good in or out of water and whether they add volume or texture or whether they add a, a sheer presence. Um, So something that would add a sheer presence is something like Omphaloides. So Omphaloides is an annual, which is not what we're talking about today, but it's a really lovely example. It's light and it's white, and you could use it almost in layers, like a curtain, but as you put it in different places along your curtain, it will give you a sense of depth because of its nature. It's light enough to be there, but it's not so dense, even though it's got multiple tiny little white heads, that it forms a block. It forms a, almost a path through in layers, and that sheer texture is really interesting and useful in floristry. Okay, so next on my list is low maintenance. So I work on a theory or principle of things getting two feeds a year and one weed per season. So I'm pretty mean. Anything that needs to be looked after more than that, other than cutting, really has to justify its space and be truly special. Next on my list is PBR, so plant breeders' rights. And I think this is a difficult one because some of the varieties, some of the more unusual varieties, have PBR. I really want to grow them and I do grow them, but it makes it difficult for me to increase my stock without increasing my expenses too, too much. So that's something that we need to be careful of. I don't avoid PBR, but I am careful to see if there is an alternative that's just as good and just as useful that I'll be able to propagate from with greater freedom. 
So the next thing on my list, we're almost at the end, is flowers that will stand on a plant well. And by that I mean a flower, I don't mean it's got a lovely stem and it stands upright, because most, not all, but most of the flowers will do that. I mean that I don't have to cut it when it's in bud or when it's just opened for it to be of value to my customers and that it is able to be open and in full bloom for a day, two days, a week and still have a good seven to ten days vase life. So an example of that would be a killia, wonderful, wonderful cutting flower. But in particular, once it's there and it's open, I don't have to cut it straight away and that makes it great for our purposes. And then finally, and I'm not meaning to be challenging by saying this, but I do say it with a small smile on my face, I need to be able to produce a flower that is better, in my opinion, than the imported version. Um, So the first example that I'm going to give suits pretty much all of these characteristics. The first example that I've picked is Alcamilla mollus. Now, I know full well that my neighbours who are keen gardeners hate Alcamilla mollus, and they hate it because it is self-seeding and it appears everywhere. And when it's there, you really can't miss its frothy, limey greenness. Whereas I love it because it self-seeds, because it produces lovely long stems. It gives a flower that has that light, sheer texture, but you can make it really dense if you pack the stems together. And that frothy, kind of limey, yellowy green colour is really good as a backdrop or a contrast to pretty much every flower that we sell. And then, in addition to that, it splits and propagates really nicely and easily. It's drought tolerant. I would say that it's not invasive, but it is competitive. Um, It's pest resistant, so the rabbits don't touch it, nor do the deer. It's not unique in that you can get other similar shapes, but what it really does do when we grow it in comparison to the imported Archimilla mollus I've seen our florists receiving is produce a sturdy quality stem that still has flex and movement and a lovely plume of those little flowers on top which is not what you buy if you're receiving your flowers from elsewhere just throwing it out there so next on my list i've picked snowberry or symphocarpus so we don't at present have a white symphocarpus all of ours are pink none of the ones that we grow at the moment or that we cut at the moment are under plant breeders rights so i can propagate from them Uh, we do have some in the field now that are with plant breeders rights but that's okay we've bought them in good numbers and they will grow and expand in terms of stock size so i'm not too too worried about that however the ones that i'm propagating from or the ones i propagated from over autumn this year are wonderful because they establish quickly they're drought tolerant um you can use them in more than one season so the foliage needs to be in water but it's lovely and light and airy so it's it's a nice one to have in kind of may june um if you you're looking for something a little bit different um and it grows and spreads it's pretty invasive it's not competitive but you know it fights back nettles in our field which is quite impressive because the nettles just go on and on and on and so on and so forth so i've picked it because gardeners are not particularly fond of it um like many things that we grow it's poisonous it can be quite invasive it's a useful berry shape in autumn it has lots of ticks on my list So I've deliberately picked two things that are common. The last one that I've picked is also common, and that's a sedum, so sedum autumn joy. Um, Some people would now call it a stone crop or a hylotephium. Yes, hylotephium. Hylotelephium. I'm going to say it. I can do it. Hylotelephium. The reason that I've picked this is because it grows so easily. Like it's so desperate to live that you will get new flower heads forming with root sources on drying stems. I mean, that is my kind of flower. It will live in the desert, I think, given half a choice. 
it propagates easily, it splits beautifully. Our farmer was surprised the other day when I dug up a clump and literally broke it into four pieces in my hands and planted all four clumps. Perfect, my kind of plant. It also has a long season of interest, so you can use it as foliage. You can use it as foliage early in the season. Um, it's very productive. It produces a flower, depending on the variety you're using. Autumn Joy is a lovely pinky colour when the flower opens. And then towards the end of the season, it turns out lovely burgundy, bronzy hue. And that can be used again still as a fresh cut flower in arrangements or you can dry it and it still looks stunning. I mean, talk about value for money. Right. The reason that I've picked common things is because I'm aware that there are lots of new flower farmers listening to the podcast. And so what I'm trying to show you here is that there are plants in your garden or your neighbor's gardens or your friend's gardens that you may ask to dig up clumps of. And you may well start with just a few portions that will give you a good number of stems in your first season, but very quickly you will have an abundance because of the characteristics of the plants themselves. So that's what I'm going to encourage you to look for today. So it's possible that some of you listening to me talk today might think, oh my goodness, Rebecca's just incredibly lazy. Like all the things that she's talked about are the things that make easy plants to grow. Conversely, you might think, hmm, Rebecca's really quite savvy. I wrote a post on Instagram um, six months ago, maybe like some point last year. And it was all about something that I really learned last year and it was that average amounts of work done often really does lead to good progress average amounts of work done often leads to good progress and the reason that's important is because we work incredibly hard here at silver gray foliage anthony i the junior section Gemma, we work hard and so it's important that the work that we do adds value rather than just doing work for the sake of work's sake. And so if I could grow in abundance from lots of my plants, lots of our stock, without having to work too, too hard, it means that those fussy plants get more attention. So in reality, we choose our plants and flowers and foliage or whatever really carefully so that we have a great range and variety. We also choose our plants really carefully so that we're able to dedicate the time, attention to those fussy flowers that really do need to be mollycoddled and that we consider to be worth the time and effort to have them as part of our stock for our customers. And so that's the reason that we're so careful about the choice of everything else to suit the criteria above. It means that, yes, they are less hard work, but the ones that you all drool over, attention to those fussy flowers that really do need to be mollycoddled and that we consider to be worth the time and effort to have them as part of our stock for our customers. And so that's the reason that we're so careful about the choice of everything else to suit the criteria above. It means that, yes, they are less hard work, but the ones that you all drool over, those kind of standout roses or ranunculus or butterfly ranunculus or whatever it is, dahlia oh my goodness the dahlia anyway those flowers that everybody draws over get the time and the attention that they need because they do need more attention and more time and we can't apply that time to everything so it's not that we're lazy it's that we are really savvy about our division of labor to be able to allow us to grow all the things that you want rather than some things okay So there you go, Rebecca's thoughts from Silver Grey Foliage on what we grow and why, the characteristics that I love as a flower farmer, that as a gardener you may not be so keen on, um, and 
how you can do that if you are a new flower farmer. I hope that these things are really helpful um, and I would love it if you let me know how helpful they are either in a message or in a review or in your stories on Instagram. Please don't forget to download the Flower Farmer Bingo for February. I mean, what fun. Maybe I need to get out more, but personally I think what fun and I will be definitely giving it a go. Um, so February starts on Thursday so you have a few days to be thinking about where you want to start or if you've started where you would like to continue. Um, what is there to say in addition to that? Uh, I need to tell you that I will be back next Monday um, with another episode of Mulch and the application of your practice to your flower farm. Auntie and I would love it if you would buy us a copy, if you've enjoyed this episode, if you found it useful, and if it's within your gift. We'd really appreciate it. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll be back next week. Rebecca. Thank you for listening to Mulch. I hope that you found it useful. To find the show notes, head back to our website where you'll find links to all the things that I've been talking about in today's episode. If you're on Instagram, you can find us at Silver Grey Foliage. I would appreciate it so much if you were able to share this episode in your Instagram stories. And if you are able to leave a review, it really will help more people to get on and grow. I'll be back with you next Monday to talk about more flower farming in practice. Rebecca.